Hey everybody, how you doing? This is James from Print and Play, and I got a quick unboxing to do with you guys today that I'm a little late to the game on, but I'm pretty excited to be able to do it. I've been looking for months and months to get my hands on an NES Classic, and I finally tracked one down in China of all places instead of the Famicom. And it finally showed up in the mail today, after waiting for about a month. So I'm looking forward to cracking into this, seeing what it can do, and offering my own opinion on it, even though I'm a little late. So let's just dig into it and see what it looks like. So I've gone ahead and cut a slit in the top there. You can go ahead and pull it out. Um, the first thing we have, obviously, is the console itself, which is a pretty decent replica of the actual uh, original Nintendo, probably at about a quarter scale, maybe a little bit less. So it's pretty light. Uh, the construction's decent enough. Power buttons are a little rattly, but overall it seems to be pretty well put together. Reaching in, we have the first controller. Now, the seller says this one comes with two, and really, there's not much more iconic than this. Your standard D-pad, select, start, and your B and A buttons, it really didn't get much simpler than that. Now, uh, there's supposed to be a second one, and there we go. Same as the first. Let's see. Next, we have a set of AV cables. Huh, they're really sticking with the uh, the classic theme. I wasn't aware it could do HDMI and uh, AV out, but it's good to have in case you have an older TV. And that's just a standard USB power brick. It's 5 volts, 500 milliamps, so what you would expect from an older cell phone charger. There's a, I'm assuming, Chinese instruction manual. Oh, there's an English section too. Just some diagrams of the uh, system. And you can see that. There's a, it looks like a piece of cardboard. Oh, it's kind of like a, a mini poster with the NES Classic itself photoshopped horribly into the bottom, but. Oh, and the controllers are photoshopped into their hands. And it looks like there's a list of some of the games on the back. Alrighty, well, let's get this sucker booted up. I've been looking forward to this. I'm just going to... Let's see. I'll unplug, plug my RetroPie setup. It's the HDMI here. And... We will go ahead and plug in... Well, it looks like they decided to stick with the standard AV out on this, so... All right, bear with me. Alrighty, well that's taken care of. Let's get this sucker turned on and see what it can do. Hmm. Well, that's not good. Oh, that's weird. Uh, it looks like reset's labeled on the left and power's labeled on the right. Huh. Hmm. And the controller doesn't work. That also doesn't look anything like the menus I've seen online. Well, it's not the controller. Okay, well, the second player controller is actually the first player controller, so that's interesting. 
Okay, well, let's take a look and see what we've got, I guess. So we got Ninja Turtles 1, 2, 3, and 4. I don't recall there being a Ninja Turtles 4. Oh, Tournament Fighter. Now, there is a noticeable hum over the audio as well. Um, the controller feels okay. It's pretty light. The uh, buttons feel a little edgier. Like, the edges are a little bit sharper uh, than they would normally be. Um, feels like it might scratch your finger a little bit if you played it long enough. Guess it helps if I plug in the second player controller. It looks like this is maybe two player only, or maybe I select the two player mode. Alrighty, well, let's take a look at this and see how it plays. Got Donatello versus Raphael. You know, guys, I'm beginning to doubt that this is an actual licensed Nintendo product. Um, so obviously, this is a bootleg. Uh, this is a controller. This is a system I picked up from uh, AliExpress for about thirty bucks, and uh, I just wanted to see what it was like in terms of the build quality. The controllers have the same flaws that a lot of the USB uh, gamepads that you get from China have. Uh, if I'm pressing left or right and I'm pressing anywhere near the top of the left or the right arrow, it uh, causes you to jump, so it's triggering the app. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the other games that are in here and see what else we've got. I'm actually kind of interested to see what Super Mario Brothers looks like, assuming Super Mario Brothers is on here somewhere. Well, 1942, that's actually one of my favorite games uh, in the arcade and on the NES. Oh, there we go, Super Mario. Now the colors are a little off from the um, original game. I'm also noting, noticing up here it says score instead of Mario, so I don't know if the bootleggers thought by taking Mario's name out of it that it was going to be uh, less likely to get them in trouble with Nintendo, but it plays reasonably well. Um, Mario isn't one of the games that makes exclusive, uh, or makes a lot of use of the up and down on it, so the issue with it holding up and down when you're going left and right isn't really prevalent here. It's not causing many issues. Okay, well, we won't let that play for too long. I don't need a copyright strike from Nintendo. I'll go ahead and take a look at Adventure Island 2. I mean, Adventure Island as well, not Adventure Island 2. Well, the sound's off on that one. I've played this game a lot. The uh, hammer does not sound right. Um, so controls are pretty good here. Uh, the controllers, again, it's not no replacement for the original one, but uh, it's not terrible. I've definitely used worse controllers. I'm going to sample through a couple of the other games so you guys can get an idea of what it looks like. Now, there are a lot of uh, a lot of unique games on here, which is pretty impressive. A lot of these systems end up having, you know, 30 or 40 games on them, and they just repeat with different names. So it'll have Super Mario, and it'll have Fast Mario, and then Bizarre Mario, and it's all the, the same game just repeated over and over again. That is legitimately Adventure Island 4. Let's take a look at the Contra games, too. Oh, there's a sub-menu for Contra, so you go into Contra and then you gotta pick Contra again. The video looks pretty good. Uh, the colors aren't perfect. The sound's decent. 
Um, my original uh, thought process was that this was basically going to be an... Well, it's definitely an uh, NOAC or Nintendo on a chip. Um, but I thought it was basically going to be old stock from the old PowerJoy systems. Uh, I literally thought that they figured, hey, uh, the Nintendo Classic is super popular right now. We can probably take advantage of that and sell off some of the old stock by making a new case for it. But um, the one of the reasons I wanted to check Mario is because Mario's sound, I know for a fact, was um, was really messed up in the um, PowerJoy, which was basically like an N64 controller with a Nintendo stuck, stuffed inside it. Um, and it sounded okay there, so I'm not... Uh, I'm thinking this is an updated version of that, so that's good. And probably not good for Nintendo, because this isn't a bad alternative as far as I can see. As you guys can see, I'm terrible at Contra. Uh, I'll pick a couple more, we'll take a look at them, and then I think we'll dig in. I think we'll pull apart the system and see what it looks like on the inside. I'm expecting it to have a really small circuit board with a, perhaps another mini circuit board up at the front where the controllers are. Um, I'm really not expecting there to be much to it. One of the games that we didn't get in uh, Canada in the US that they got in Japan that I loved, I ended up playing this game, my parents bought me a 110 in one game cartridge and this was on it, and it was just about the only Nintendo game my dad actually cared to play. Well, we'll pick one more game out of the menu, maybe from the, uh, the other end of the list. Well, this is kind of appropriate. We should probably uh, load this one up. Oh, that guy's not going to be happy with me. I'm really good at breaking windows. I'm gonna blame this on the controller. Uh, my, my skills are pretty good, so it's gotta be the uh, controller that's the problem here. Alrighty, that's enough. So, uh, I'm gonna disconnect this and remove the TV, and then I think we'll switch to the overhead view, and I'll go ahead and take it apart and we'll see what makes it tick. Alrighty, so here we have the bootleg NES console. They've gone to some painstaking details to keep stuff accurate, which is interesting because they screwed up the reset and power buttons, and they also screwed up the controller order. And they didn't stick with the uh, controller ports from the Wii and the Wii U, the um, nunchuck connector. They instead went with a Sega Genesis controller setup, so kind of like this. Sure, probably should have tested to see if this would have worked on it, but it's the standard connection, although it's, it's kind of loose. Not a satisfying click when you stick that in there. Well, let's see what's under the cover. I'm assuming this is all Phillips because the one exposed screw is Phillips and the rest are probably going to be underneath here. Let's go ahead and pull these off. Try not to lose them. Put this back together later. Alrighty. One. There's two. Three. And four. And I'll be moving as well. All these plastics and A lot of these plastics end up being a little bit uh, flimsy or. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Fragile. So it's better not to play with fire when you're pulling them apart. Alrighty, there's nothing in the top. Actually, now that it's pulled off, you can see it kind of curves in on the side, so the molding isn't perfect, but it's decent. This is pretty solid. I don't think uh, I don't think it would break easily. It looks like it's pretty thick. And now we're going to get our first look at the internals on a bootlegged NES Classic from China. And that's pretty much what I expected. There is not really much to this. In fact, the largest circuit board in the entire setup is for the controller ports and the uh, power and reset switch. I'm kind of surprised they didn't split it into two to save the money for the space in between them, but I guess that gives it some extra rigidity. Now what I'm expecting to see here is an upgraded version of the NOAC, or the Nintendo on a chip, 
Um, and I'm also expecting to see what's normally called a glop top, which is the um, memory slash controller slash uh, all-in-one uh, Nintendo solution they've sort of developed. If you open up a lot of the uh, 501 cartridges, there'll be a what's called a glop top, and I'll show it to you in a second if I'm right. Um, go ahead by pulling off the header for the power in the AV. And right off the bat, I can see there's four wires going to it, which means that we should have our ground, which will be... Well, it's coming through here. So we've got our ground, we've got our power, so ground and power coming from here. Then the ground is bridged from the USB connector to the AV uh, port, which would also be giving us some of our hum, I believe. Uh, then we have video, which is a separate thing, and then our audio, our left and right, are both connected to the same pad, so it's actually just dual mono. So then here, we have what will be the brains of the operation. And there's the glop top that I was talking about. So you see these commonly, they're cheap, um, they don't have particularly pretty, and this is basically the essence of a 501 game cartridge. So on the other side of this we should see and this is the updated version of the NOAC. So this is kind of ingenious because they're getting away with existing technology. They, uh, there, are all, all so there are all sorts of NES clones that you can get from Japan or from China that use this type of chip. So this chip basically contains hardware, not quite emulation, more like, I guess, simulation, um, of everything an original Nintendo did. So the PPU, the CPU, uh, the memory, it's all contained in this one chip. And all they've done to create this unit is essentially solder a single cartridge directly to a board that connects it directly to here. So in a way, this is still connected to a cartridge. And I would guess that you would be able to, if you were decent enough with your soldering skills, desolder or decouple this chip from the integrated board or the integrated cartridge and connect it to a cartridge slot. Um, and, but it's very easy to actually buy a bootleg system from uh, China that does that already. So there wouldn't be a lot of reason to do it other than to prove you can. So go ahead and stick that back in there. And then for the front circuit board, it's pretty much empty. You can see that you've got um, your power switches over here. So there'll be power coming through here, uh, through one of these pins, then going through here. The reset is just wired in series with the power. So tapping this just disrupts the power going to the, the switch or going to here, to the uh, main circuit board. Uh, the LED power, there's the resistor for it. Um, They've just sort of quickly soldered in place. There's no trimming or anything that's happened here. Um, and then the rest of the pins will actually be for the two controller ports. I thought while we were at it, we might as well open up one of these controllers and see what they look like on the inside. Um, so here we go. It's funny, the screws in the controllers feel like they're better uh, situated than the, the screws in the uh, actual console. Alrighty, let's go ahead and crack this open. Um, it's looking pretty much exactly the same as the internals of an actual Nintendo controller, to be completely honest. Yeah, once again we've got a glop top here. This leads me to believe that a, a Sega Genesis controller probably is not going to be compatible with this. Um, the Nintendo controllers themselves had an IC in them that uh, allowed it to send information. So you basically had a, a positive, negative, and then data in, data out type thing. Um, versus it saying, you know, cross this wire for this wire for up, down, left, right. Whereas a Sega Genesis controller with its nine pins was basically, each pin represented, with the exception of ground, uh, one of the buttons that you could push, up, down, left, right, start, A, B, C. There's your nine. Uh, it wasn't until they implemented the six-button controller that they had to get a little more creative with what they were sending through the bus. Um, so that's not an exact duplicate of the board. This is definitely a cut-down board versus what you get in an actual Nintendo controller. But I think if you had uh, controllers that were in damaged cases, you could probably use this case on an actual Nintendo controller um, to refurbish it. You know, it doesn't say Nintendo on it, but it's pretty close. And if your sticker was in good shape, you could probably peel this sticker off and replace it. And that's it. Not much to that. And there you have it. A quick run through of a bootlegged NES classic. 
Um, they really kind of hit the mark on this one. The quality isn't fantastic, but there is an overwhelming desire to have uh, the NES Classic. So for people that didn't get one, this isn't a terrible stopgate measure. Uh, and for reference, I did actually connect a Sega Genesis controller to it, and a total of one button on it does something. The down button makes it go up. And that's it. Alrighty, well once again, I'm James from Print and Play. Thanks for sticking around till the end. Let me know in the comments below what you think I should do with it. Should I keep it as is? Should I modify it and put an orange pie or a raspberry pie into it? Let me know. If you like this video, why not toss me a thumbs up? If you want to see more of my content as I put it out, why not subscribe and click the bell so you're notified when my stuff comes out? And if you have something you want to see me look at or tear apart in the future, toss it in the comments below and I'll see what I can do. Alrighty, until next time, stay creative.